Hello, everybody. Um, the other day I sent an email to my pastor and I want to read it to you. And, uh, and then I'm going to have a talk with him. So here's the email I sent. I said, uh, Dear Pastor Crosby, I listened to your message today with delight. Since all that you said has been the topic of the YouTube channel I've been hosting for the last two years. All truth is God's truth. Every square inch of this universe shows God's hand, the wealth of his creativity and the riches of his grace and mercy. <clears throat> for the last two years, I've been having conversations with scientific types, physicists, computer geeks, philosophers, and folks who are on the road towards Christ or have recently made the decision to follow him. Many speak of the difficulty of finding a church where they can be honest about their thoughts and their process. I would love to introduce my viewers to you and to the ideas you put forth today. So now I'm going to talk to Pastor Crosby. Well, I'm delighted to be here today with John Crosby, who is the interim pastor at Menlo Church in the Bay Area in California. And uh, I've been intrigued by your work ever since you got here. So I'm really happy to have you here to talk with us. And I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about your background, how you grew up and uh, how you first got interested in Christ and then how you ended up as a pastor. Let me give uh, what I hope is the uh, three to four minute version. I am the, uh, <laughs> I'm the eldest of four boys, uh, Irish Roman Catholic, uh, born in uh, Toledo, raised in Chicago. Um, typically dysfunctional American family. Uh, and <laughs> <Me too. laughs> uh, that, that includes uh, an ambivalent relationship with the Catholic Church growing up by folks had that same ambivalence, but put us, subjected us to parochial schools until uh, either they didn't, couldn't pay anymore or uh, it was clearly not working. Uh, my rejection in, I don't know, uh, middle school after I got kicked out of being an altar boy was uh, a lot less about uh, intellectualism than it was about uh, they seemed to be all about rules. I wasn't good at rules, seemed like a bad mix. And uh, so when I left the church, it was not a formal intellectual thing, but then as I grew into that high achiever, fake it, smart kid in high school and college, uh, I did start to buttress my reasons against Christianity at least. Um, that served me pretty well until uh, the end of high school, beginning of college, went through a, an organization a lot like Young Life, Campus Life. I uh, came to a living relationship with Christ. I played football my freshman year in college in a secular setting and then transferred to Wheaton College, where I'd say that my um, Christian identity and maybe more important, my Christian mind uh, started to develop to try to, as Dr. Holmes talked about, develop a Christian view of the world. And um, okay, so wait a minute. You were a student of Arthur Holmes. I was. Oh I my was. gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I just love his lectures. I've watched probably half of the the lectures from his philosophy series online. He is such a marvelous teacher. Wow, what a he's, mind. He's very special, incredibly intellectually powerful and yet like Lewis with the ability to take the very complex and make it accessible and then for those of us outside of the Christian faith walk us in step by step all that to say that was a, a special gift I think frankly Karen I realized that even at the time that this was a special thing um, I graduated from uh, Wheaton went to Gordon Conwell for seminary education came back to the Wheaton area to do an internship and ended up um, that Dr. Holmes uh, started coming to the church that I was the assistant pastor. Oh my God. And uh, I, I remember the first time I was preaching and I said, we need to develop a Christian worldview. And I look out there and I see he had this huge bald head and I see that the head just sort of cocked to the side like, I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that uh, 
that was great. Um, it really was an introduction though into the world of the mind through the, uh, primarily through the avenue of the Inklings, that group around C.S. Lewis and uh, Tolkien and Owen Barfield who, uh, whose intellectual ferment was so at contrast with what was happening at Oxford. In other words, Oxford is the place where uh, people see the best ideas in the world. They are on the faculty at Oxford but they are Christian, and so in that setting are seen as a more despised minority. I think that that's not the case at Stanford, where you are just seen as, oh, okay, you're a Christian, one of many uh, viewpoints. Uh, but Lewis taught me how to think in a way that was both convicted, but also, I don't want to say humble, because I'm not sure how humble he was, but but open to dialogue, and, and I wanted that very much. And then I'd say that uh, the last 30 years in the, in the pulpit have been a terrific gift from God to have the excuse. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting in John Ortberg's office uh, filled with bookshelves, and uh, I just brought two boxes of mine. But mine would be the same way at home where these are the great thinkers of the world, Christian and non-Christian, and we get the chance to bring them before people and then try to make them accessible to what's happening at their kitchen table on Tuesday evening, in their fights with their children on Thursday afternoon, in their desire to make sense of their career on a, a, a long Saturday afternoon. So uh, that, that has been my great the joy over the last uh, years, and I, I'd say that the, the the last piece of it for me has been coming to um, Stanford and not having to do it every week. It, it, it is it, it becomes mechanical if you're just churning it out once a week, and it's been a delight to be able to sit here and have a chance to to think and talk with people of great faith and people of no faith at all. So. That's the journey. Now, you're able to have that space because Menlo is a multi-campus church with a number of other pastors. And so you sort of share the teaching responsibilities with some of the other pastors. Is that what gives you that space? It is. Uh, when I came, the idea was that I would uh, uh, preach no more than 20% of the time so that we could expose the, the campuses to these 10 or 12 other great young communicators, men and women, and, and give them the chance to grow up. As we go into the second year of the transition, they've asked me to raise that to 40 or 50% of the time. And then, so that after a while, I think without one voice, uh, things just sort of feel scattershot. And what you need is, uh, a, a thread that goes through. And so I'm going to hopefully, until uh, God brings a new pastor to Menlo, be part of that thread. Well, I had the privilege maybe a few months ago to have a conversation with Matt Stefan, who's one of those young thinkers. And he's just got an incredible mind. And uh, so for anybody who's watching this one, I'll put a link to that talk with Matt as well so that you can. And should. Matt is frightfully him. bright. And I think has a great future in translating the values of the kingdom of heaven uh, mm -hmm. to those of us here. Yeah, so um, how do you bridge that gap for, um, I know that you were talking about using all of this knowledge and wisdom that has been gained from the great thinkers of the past and making it accessible to people at their kitchen table, which is absolutely and incredibly valuable. I mean, it's been foundational for me growing up in the church. I mean, I, I became a Christian when I was 30, but the pastor that uh, helped me get started actually used to, every time I'd have a question, I'd call him, he would drive 10 miles and sit at my kitchen table and walk through the word with me. So I, I really appreciate that kitchen table wisdom. Um, but there's also this like seemingly large gap right now with so many, particularly young men, I think, who have either grown up in the church and then felt disenfranchised as you did, 
or um, who have stayed in the church and continue to try to kind of find their tribe, the people who are interested in talking about these ideas with them, because it's one thing to have the ideas coming from the pulpit and then filtered down to us in an accessible way, but then everybody else who's sitting in the congregation may feel inadequate to be able to figure out who to reach out to who might also be interested in what they think, or they may feel that what they're thinking is a little offside and be a little um, afraid to talk about what they're thinking. <laughs> because the church doesn't always make it easy to ask perplexing questions. So how do you navigate that whole thing? Well, that's, that's a lot of different directions there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, two things. Uh, the first is that I, I saw my calling um, as, without putting myself in the same category, the same as St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine has said that his mission in life was to help people with the uh, journey from the head to the heart, that uh, knowledge comes into the head, but wisdom settles in the heart. And that is the, the sacred journey, according to Augustine. And that would be my calling as well to say, it is not how many Bible verses you know, it's how those start to lodge in the heart and affect the way that you deal with your relationship with others, your feelings about yourself and your sense of the presence of God, that up and in and out that Menlo Church uh, talks about. That's that's number one, that, that what we're involved with is that the great descent. The second though, is that it seems to me, whether it's men or women, that uh, people can be exposed to thoughts or even to truth or even to compelling truth in a lecture hall or a sermon in a, a sanctuary, but that's not where life change happens. Life change happens, I believe, primarily in small conversations, two, three, four, five, six people who are there be and because of their relationship with each other are able to open up and say, you know, he started to talk about a grace that would allow us even to find a way to, to forgive this Rittenhouse kid who just got off scot-free from apparently killing people in the street. That's bullshit, you know? And the ability to say that without feeling judged is the start of that conversation. And if they feel like that has to stay bottled up, then uh, for men, they end up with two compartments in their brain the church brain and the real brain. And there's no transference between the two. So my hope is that we will- Men allow... and women, men and women have those compartments. Right. Although men, <laughs> I think, uh, men, uh, women, it seems to me, are much better at living in multiple spheres at the same time. Men compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether that's work and home or faith and practice, I, I can have a whole set of beliefs over here that have very little impact on my actions over there. And that's, again, I believe happening when we allow two or more people into our lives where we can have that dialogue. It does not always appear sacred. A friend of mine and I were out on a bike ride and he was saying, I got no idea what to say to my son when he says, how can you believe all that church BS after what you just saw happen in the Trump presidency? And he said, I didn't know how to talk to him. And our ability just to talk about that helps him not learn the right words, but learn the right tone to have that discussion with his son. I think, uh, I'll, I'll close with this. I, I think that many of these discussions about questions or objections or reservations that people have about Christian truth are made much more complicated by the uh, broken view of the church that many 21st century Americans ought to be having right now. There ought to be reservations, skepticism, concerns about the institutional church. And that is part of the conversation that we need to be having about faith. 
Well, there certainly are reservations and skepticism about the institutional church and um, but maybe before we get to that, I want to go back to something you said when you said um, the the sever the, the severing between faith and actions. And one of the reasons I started this YouTube channel a couple of years ago was that I had gotten very interested in the ideas of Jordan Peterson. Have you heard about him at I all? I heard the name, don't know him well. Okay. Well, he's a psychologist, and in addition to all of his psychology lectures online, a few years back, he put up, he put up a series of 12 lectures that he did on the Bible, looking at the Bible from a psychological perspective. That's what I remember hearing. Yes, and they are un unbelievable. <laughs> They're amazing. Um, so much depth of uh, truth that comes out of them, especially considering the direction that he is coming from. And um, there, there's this whole online community of people who want to talk about the ideas that he broached in those videos. But one of his main lines of thinking is that the problem with the church today, as the problem with all of life, is this severing between faith and action or between our intentions and our actions. Um, and that his, his really big idea is that at each moment in time, so C.S. Lewis talks about the now and how the now is the moment that meets the eternal. Um, John brought that up in one of his conversations online a couple of weeks ago. Um, so you have this moment of now, and as you look out into this field of possibility that opens up in front of you, it's um, there's it's there's too many things to think about. There's too many options, and the only way that you can really find your way across that field, in the best way, is if you focus on the highest good of which you can conceive, and that focus will bring into order the things in front of you and kind of show you. The, the steps that you need to take forward. And that there's a little glimmer out in front of you that sort of draws you forward, this little thread that says, come this way. And, um, and as you go step by step, you might, you might think that you're heading towards this highest good. And maybe you find out you're a little bit off balance and you're not quite going in the right direction, but then you learn something, something happens and you have an experience. And so then you, can alter your, your direction a little bit, but you always have that vision of the highest good of which you can conceive. And um, you know that historically part of what has happened in the church is that much of what passes for faith is just a propositional statement of belief that's not connected to daily life, that's not connected to the way that we interact with each other or the way that we love each other or fail to love each other. So um, that is what a lot of people that have been listening to Jordan Peterson have been trying to institute in their lives. And he starts with a, a simple uh, illustration where he says, clean your room. That's a good place to start. Before you go out and try to change the world, start with cleaning your room, which of course is a metaphor for the larger part about working on your own life and learning how to be a responsible citizen and how to take care of things. But this idea of cleaning your room has many aspects. And one of those aspects is that as you begin, you look at the disorder in your room or in your life, as you begin to try to put things in order, you have to think about what your goals are and what your values are and what you really desire and why it got this way. And so it, it invests so many parts of your life into this aspect of cleaning your room, like you have all these empty bookshelves. <laughs> if all your books came from your home in Chicago and, and they, they dumped into your office, you know, how would you organize them? What, what would be the categories that you'd put them up? And so as you're thinking that through, that all connects up with the way that your own brain is wired and all the experiences that you've had in life and how you happen to think about things and what you want people to see when they walk into your room. And it's all combinatorially explosive, right? But the path forward is always this little step where you learn and that 
transforms you internally. And then you take another little step and you learn. And as we've had this longer conversation online, that all gets tied into this idea of the resurrection. <laughs> Because the resurrection is the transformative moment in history that begins to spool out and transform people's lives from that moment forward and really transforms history looking backwards as well. So um, do you have anything you'd like to say about the resurrection? <laughs> that was a long way around. <laughs> Dude, do you have Usually is when I get started. <laughs> I think that um, I, I would choose to differentiate myself from uh, Dr. Holmes and what I often see as I listen to philosophical discussions uh, between the philosopher's mode and the pastor's mode. My uh, sense has been that as you talked about that highest ordering principle, to use somebody else's uh, language, that thing that is the highest good. Um, in, in pastoral terms, I would say that there is a simultaneous struggle going on in every human heart between uh, the beautiful or the joy that Lewis talks about and the broken that is my experience, not only in the world around us as I see it, but in my own human heart. And so that if there is truth with a capital T or a desire, which I would see as different from the learning of knowledge, if there is truth, then it is the ability of that joy, that uh, greater truth to come and address the brokenness inside the human heart already. My life changed when I understood that uh, the cure for that brokenness in my human heart was not learning more, achieving more, becoming a better person, but rather accepting from the outside the word grace, that grace was needed for me not to accept myself, but to see myself as a person with worth created in the image of God who was so desperately broken that I could not get there. And grace was the gift of God to say, you don't have to fight your way up the stairs. I will bring you there. That grace, it seems to me, that living connection with a, a God who does not keep score is what offers me a renewed, restored, restoring view of my soul and the world that I live in. That's, that becomes my ordering principle, Karen, mm -hmm. that there is great joy and beauty in the world that I am marred from being able to access or participate or help in that because of the brokenness inside of me that frankly puts dirt on everything I touch and that the answer is not to clean that, but to allow the grace of God as uh, Paul says to the Corinthians, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace has not been without effect. God's grace changes us in ways that getting smarter or cleaning up our act never could. When I look, uh, uh, for me, a long way around to my view of the resurrection, the, the resurrection is the means by which joy, beauty, truth descends into the human sphere into the human sphere, comes over and embraces my broken attempts to get up the ladder and says, let me wash you clean and take you on a journey that you can never make without yourself. And what is needed for me is to, instead of learning more about the one who comes with that, to embrace and allow God to embrace me in ways that give me a sense that... Um, Mother Teresa of Avila said, all will be well, and all will be well, and all will be very well indeed. And when I sit in grace, I have that belief that this journey will end well. That was so beautiful. And that was so well said. 
one of the things I've talked about before on the channel is um, a book that I read when I was a missionary in Japan that was very transformational. <clears throat> And it, it's a book that was quite famous in Japan, although it, it didn't have the impact I think that the author intended. She was a Christian and she was writing a, about a true story of a man who um, ultimately gave his own life for all the people on a train that he was on. He threw himself on the tracks to stop the train from catapulting off of a precipice. Um, but the way that that guy became a Christian was that he had been walking down a street one day on a cold winter day, and there was a street preacher out there in the snow and the cold preaching the gospel, and he felt sorry for him, and he said, I don't believe what you're saying, but you're cold, so why don't you come over to my house and have a cup of tea? So he invited this street preacher in, and in their conversation, the street preacher challenged him. He said, <clears throat> I know you don't believe, but here's, here's God's word. And if you just take any one verse, one verse, and try to live it, you'll find out whether it's true or not. Actually, I think Jesus says something like that in John 6. Um, but the, the verse he chose was, um, love your enemies. And he tried. He tried very hard to do what the verse said and quickly found that he was broken and that he just couldn't do it. And that without, without the grace of God, there was no way he could live up to even just that one verse. And um, that was what, you know, early in my Christian walk, somebody taught me a very simple illustration that the difference between Christianity and all other religions is that all other religions have some sort of a system some sort of steps that you have to take, some system of rules or regulations that you have to follow in order to make your way up to heaven. But Christianity is the only one that says, I know that you are but dust and I know your problems and I know your brokenness and I will reach down and I will bring you up with me. And that's the picture of the resurrection, right? So um, <clears throat> that was just, that was just marvelous. Well, I know that you have a really busy life and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but sure. um, do you see any way forward in the church for making more opportunities for people to kind of find their tribe of places that they can ask some of these questions? And, and I, I ask this question because my own experience has been that I've been a Christian for 40 years and for most of that time, I've had no place inside the church to talk about my ideas. <laughs> and for a long time, I just sort of gave up even thinking about it. And that's when I started doing artwork, because I thought maybe I could communicate some of what was inside me by doing art. And, and, um, and I think that was fruitful in my life, because I learned a lot. <clears throat> <clears throat> but in the last few years, I have found a tribe. I've found this tribe of people who really love talking about these things and digging deeper. And um, I think together we're actually finding answers in physics and in biology and uh, digging into all these things. And, and I think that's fruitful too. That's not, that's not the way to salvation, but it's fruitful for the life that we're living right now. So how would you see making a way in the church so that people could i mean i know one of the great things about the church is that when you're in a small group you're with people who have widely diverse ways of looking at the world and that's the beauty of a small group but it seems to me we could have groups that are like that but then also have groups that are interested in the things that really are that we're interested in you know is there a way to do that do you think <clears throat> The short answer is I, I, I think yes, although I, I think that in the end, the church will probably not, should not uh, allow itself to be uh, degenerated into a bunch of different focus groups, everybody looking at what is their passion, um, uh, the, the artists and the social activists, the intellectuals and the, <laughs> and the relationalists. <laughs> and um, and I see that happen so often, and each of us tend to judge the ones in the other circles a little less than they are. 
Um, well, that would be if what you're doing is developing groups where everybody agrees with each other. So that's not the kind of thing I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about groups where, where people are looking at a, a common topic, but finding ways that they can disagree with each other and learn from each other, right? Well, I, I think that those are there. They are not plentiful in part because people live in a world where they are battered enough that they do need that sense of restorative grace or, or the support of other people. But I do think that there are places that uh, that kind of inquiry, including uh, doubt and disagreement uh, can be not only accepted, but welcomed. I'd suggest that it probably in places like Menlo is more likely to be found in a uh, special focus, a, a book study or a study of a topic, uh, whether that's Phillips Yancey, the problem of pain or uh, some other interest that gathers people around something. And then as they look at that, either the topic or the book, they bring their different perspectives to it that ends up sparking uh, valuable uh, perspectives. At the two churches I was at before, there ended up being groups of uh, people that were, were called inquirers, or uh, th there was one called the grapplers, and they would uh, throw a, a topic out on the table in the middle and approach that from many different perspectives. Uh, and so I think those things are there. I, I think that probably, I think the church is a church when it is organized, not by its boundaries, but by its center. And if we say that the primary reason for a church to exist is to draw people toward that center, it is the tiny little story of someone who dies on a cross and comes back three days later to life. And that story of the gospel needs to remain at the center, a source of life to some, confusion for others, a stumbling block uh, to many, but it is the organizing principle around which all these other things can find their own perspective. That, that's, the, that's the ticket right there, man. <laughs> Uh, we'll see. Because we'll see. One of the things that I look at all the time is how um, the things that we see, I have this idea also that all truth is God's truth. So that means that if I'm looking at the organization of a cell and the organization of a church, there are going to be commonalities there. Mm -hmm. And a cell is not defined by its boundary, but it's defined by what, keep, what, what causes it to stay together is what's the center. Whatever that center is in a cell, nobody really knows but there's something that holds it together rather than allowing it to disperse. And the boundary actually has to develop out of that because of the center, not that the center develops because of the boundary, right? So in the same way, you can look at a tree and there's all sorts of lessons you can learn from a tree and you can extrapolate those lessons out and see them in every area of knowledge. And, uh, and that's one of the beautiful things about the way the world is constructed is that there's all these levels and they all connect up somewhere or another. So um, I love that picture that you made. And um, this has been just a totally refreshing time. I really appreciate you spending the time with me. And Well, it goes both ways, Karen. It's fun to hear that there are these pockets of lively conversation where people can feel free to ask, disagree, and still engage. I, I love that. I, I commend to you the, the life and works of Francis Collins, who would fit into this group that you are talking about, people who see God at work in disparate places and still have the humility and curiosity to meet with people like Collins's friend Fauci, who doesn't share that same opinion, and they learn from each other. So good for you. Thank you. Have a great day. You also. Okay. Take care. Thanks for the time. Yeah. Bye-bye. You betcha.